Good morning. And thanks for having me. Also, uh, I just have to comment, this is a great agenda, the way that it's starting with an overview and then moving more and more into actionable areas. And my job, basically, is to try to give you a larger global view of some of the challenges facing us. Um, with that in mind, there are going to be four sections of my thought. First is the world we're living in now. I want to give you a perspective of how we live now. Then I want to talk about some of the challenges related to our world. Then solutions that are actually happening today. And then I want to give a, a view of some of the possible futures that seem to be emerging out of those solutions. All right, and I'm going to try to do this in a way that we'll have plenty of time for questions. So basically, the world we live in is much, much different than the world of even 100 years ago. We, the 20th century was a huge change for mankind. And there's a, a very simple equation I can take you through to give you an idea of the magnitude of that change. The first thing was, <clears throat> as many of you know, it took 30,000 years for mankind to grow to a billion people, which happened in the early 1800s. However, in the 20th century, the population grew by four times in one century. So that's one part of the equation. The economy grew by 20 times in one century, in the 20th century. And, and how could that happen? So we get four times as many people, we have 20 times the economy, what is the driver? And I'd propose to you that the driver is the fact that energy consumption grew by 40 times in one century. In fact, there are some economists that say money is only a proxy for energy. That, that what we live in, if you look around us, the world we live in is completely transformed by the application of fossil fuels. And this is why Warren Buffett walks, uh, travels around the country and talks to graduate schools and he says, if your objective in your life is to have a great lifestyle, you're done. That a family of four today has a lifestyle that far exceeds anything that a king could have Im imagined in previous centuries. In fact, I'd propose that it's possible that my dogs live a life way beyond the imagination of any king. If you look at mobility, health, comfort, entertainment, all the things that are important to us. Uh, isn't it cool that my dogs get to be in the presentation? I just thought I'd point that out. If you look at the fossil fuels that are behind the massive growth of our economy, what they translate to us, and there's some argument about this, uh, there's a scientist in France named Giancovici. His calculations indicate that in order to maintain the lifestyles we have, before 1900 would take 20 slaves. Our chief scientist estimates that it's closer to 300 slaves. So however you figure it, we have a lifestyle that would require a whole lot of human effort in any other place and time in the history of our race. And how does that happen? Well, I'll take you through the brief story. Energy comes to the earth from the sun over millions of years, and it's captured by photosynthesis at about a 6% efficiency. And all these leaves, plankton, etc., are sucked into the earth, add 40 million to a billion years with time and pressure and heat, and you create fossil fuels. Most people don't consider that when they get a gallon of gas, it's between 40 million and a billion years in the making. I mean, that's not simple. A and there's a huge value in that. Here's the chain. Sun, photosynthesis. Then it turns in, in photosynthesis, it turns into carbohydrates. With heat, pressure, and time, it turns into hydrocarbons, which is a dramatic concentration of that energy in terms of chemical bonds. Then what we do is we add fire, 
the fire releases the chemical bonds, and it's that pop, that explosion that is behind everything. And we don't see the fire. I mean, cavemen saw the fire. We don't see it because what we do is we have the fire way out in the suburbs, in the middle of nowhere at our power plants, and we convert the work of that power through electrical lines. Or we have the power under the hood of our car, but our cars are designed so we just don't see it. And from that explosion comes the life that we get to live. It's cool, isn't it? I mean, if you think about it, who would have thought? This is the kind of energy transfer we have going on. The average American drives their car with, uh, every day with the amount of fuel that is an equivalent of 100 times the weight of their car in ancient plants. So we are literally talking about the equivalent of you taking 400,000 pounds of plants in your yard and burning it in order for you to get around. Interesting thought, isn't it? Two and a half gallons of gas equals months of, man, of manpower. So the fact that this costs about $5 is a huge bargain for us. We live in a world where anybody with a normal income could travel the world reasonably. We have food, the average food, by the time it hits your table, it has traveled 1,500 miles and changed hands six times. Now, just as a comparison, in 1900, a very popular gift in New York was an orange because it had come all the way from Florida. Square foot per person has doubled since the 70s in the United States. It's this huge production power. And we even have a world where we import water from Fiji. When our own water is perfectly drinkable, why? Because we feel like it. That this is cool. And that's not enough. <laughs> also, not only do we get to enjoy all this stuff, but there's another thing happening, and that our lifespans are increasing dramatically. In 1900, the average world lifespan was 39 years. Now it's 78. And lifespan is increasing five hours a day today. So any way you look at it, huge wins. High five. This is a great world we've created. And we should celebrate like crazy. OK, so I say, this is time for me to get down. <clears throat> this is kind of the high point. But what I want to do is, is say, uh, most people, we live in the world. This is the water we are swimming in. So we don't even think about it. But, you, uh, but, but we need to take a perspective that the world we live in has been transformed by fossil fuels. And we have to ask the question, what does that mean to us? Not only as a civilization, but also as individuals and as people that have children or have interests that we care about. What kind of issues arise in a world that goes through this kind of disruptive transformation in just basically one lifetime? Well, there are some challenges, as you could imagine I was going to get to. And one of them is, how much of these fossil fuels are out there? This is a big question. And by the way, I'm not a supply side guy. That's not my area of expertise. Um, but there's a concept called peak oil. Has anybody heard of that before? And that's basically saying, <clears throat> the concept says that it's not like we're going to barrel forward using oil and then suddenly run out. It's more like, it's more likely that we're going to get to a point where we use about half the oil and then it's going to get harder and we're going to be accessing oil stores that have a lower energy density and are more expensive. And that when that happens, oil is going to become dramatically more expensive, but also in a very volatile way where we'll have fits and starts, etc. And if that's our future, that's a challenge. Things are going to change. 
Now, I will tell you, I talk to the supply siders. The, uh, when I say supply siders, the people that, that really study how much fossil fuel there is out there. And the range of options seems to be, I mean, the question is, how many barrels of oil did God make in the earth? And the answer is somewhere between 2 trillion and 3 trillion. Most of the optimists are at about 3 trillion. Most of the doomsayers are at about 2 trillion. You with me? We've used about a trillion. So we're either halfway done or we're a third of the way done. And in shorthand, you can assume that we, as a world, we use about 84, 80 to 90, but about 84, 85 million barrels of oil a day. That means every 12 days, we use a billion. And every year, we use about 30 billion. So that says, in 30 years, at today's rates, we're going to use about a trillion barrels of oil. So we're either at the halfway mark, or we're about 15 years away. And, and most people would agree with that. I, I mean, even the, the biggest optimists would say, yeah, about 15 years, we'll probably be at the halfway point. So what does that mean? Well, one thing is, we can see that this is oil prices. You can see we're just coming out of a spike. But even if you account for the spike, you can see there's an upward trend in oil prices. But more importantly than that, there's a volatility that is unheard of. And there are some economists that believe that volatility is more harmful than steadily rising prices. Because if the game is changing, it's hard to plan. If you really didn't know how much your food cost month to month, it would be very hard for you to make other decisions about your life. Because Next, next month, food could cost $10,000, then the month after, $1,000. It's very hard for you to sustain progress. And it may be the same way with oil. Is everybody with me? Okay, so here's another issue. Here are the three types of fossil fuels we use. And, and you'll see, and this is the number of years until depletion of confirmed resources. You can see coal, uh, the U.S. is the, the Saudi Arabia of coal. We have tons of coal. The Hopi used coal. It comes in really handy, and it's, as you'll see later, it's producing a lot of our electricity. Um, we only have 40 years of oil in confirmed resources, but that's pretty common. It's been about that way for a long time. They just keep finding it, and we keep using it, etc. Natural gas is 68 years, although this is changing. They have found some new methods that are dramatically increasing supply of, or, or confirmed supply of natural gas here in the United States. But here's a negative. Coal, I mean, in the Carter years, everybody said we've got to move everything to coal because we have so much of it, and it'll make us independent. But when you look at, at emissions, coal is the dirtiest fuel. And it's not only emissions. Uh, to, to get a BTU releases the most amount of carbon because of the lack of concentration and the lack of energy uh, density. But it also has a bunch of other really ugly, dirty stuff in it. So this is an interesting challenge, isn't it? The thing we have the most of does the most harm. So how do we deal with that? This is the emissions issue, and, and I will not, I, believe me, I have like 30 Al Gore type slides about emissions, climate change, etc. And let's just assume there's something there. Wherever you are on the controversy, that either we're going to burn up next week or no problem, it, we can go two generations before it's bad. Wh whatever you want to say, there's something there. And this is wrong, it's now 26% of the polar ice cap has melted. And then you ask, what are the real impacts on me of climate change? And really, most analysts, it's all about water. The, the way water is distributed in the world today is a function of our current temperature. And, and year-long river flows are sustained primarily through glacier, glacial storage 
in the north. And as that glacial storage is depleted, it doesn't make the water go away. It just means that the rivers stop running in the summer. Now, when you have the Yangtze River that had, in the Yangtze Valley that has 400 million people, and half of their food production is dependent on the summer winter flow, and you have geologists calculating that in a certain number of years, the glaciers are going to dry up and you're going to lose the river for three or four months in the summer. That's a big deal. And we've got people uh, in South America that are depending on hydropower where we're calculating, not we, the climate guys are calculating that the hydropower is going to shut off for a couple months a year. That is a big deal. So those are the types of global things that are coming from this. We also have a big species thing, and I won't get into that, but if you're an animal lover, just look it on, up on the internet, and you'll have plenty of things to get excited about. And here's one thing that I think is real to all of us. If you look at the top 10 world oil net exporters, there's a nonprofit called Freedom House that applies standards to different countries to try to determine how free they are. How are we doing in the world? Well, it's interesting. With the top 10 oil exporters, we've got Norway and Mexico that are free by all the criteria. They're great places to live. They do good commerce. They treat their people well. There are a couple more, Kuwait, Venezuela, Nigeria, that are partially free. I mean, they're not ideal, but they're workable. But five of them are not free. They're not nice places to live. And Tom Friedman, the New York Times writer, has put forward the hypothesis that that's because of the, the rise of petro-dictators, regimes that are self-interested, that get so much money from oil, that they don't need to have universities. They don't need an economy. They don't need a middle class. They don't even need regular trade, the way we think about it. They can afford their own lifestyles and their armies, and they can afford a lot of oppression because of the wealth of oil. So whatever bad habits they have are just really supported by the whole oil scarcity issue. So you put these together, scarcity, climate, security, and that's why if you look at Rocky Mountain Institute's uh, literature, our works, et cetera, we're not focused just on climate. Because, you know, we don't know. We, we don't, uh, and we're going to find out a lot more in the next five or ten years what the real impact of climate change is. But we have security issues. We have economic issues. All of these issues facing us about our use of fossil fuels. And the challenge for most of it, us is we only feel fossil fuels based on their price. And as we all know, price is not a reflection of the real long-term urgency of an issue. So that's what we're about. We're about the efficient and restorative use of resources, and our focus is on the shift to efficiency in renewables. And there's a very simple equation that we, as a culture, I propose, need to work on. If this is standard practice and the amount of fuel we use, and by the way, in the United States, we use double what they use in Europe, four times what they use in uh, Japan, 10 times what the average person uses in China and 20 times what they use in India. So, you know, we're, we're really getting the benefit of it. But if you take this type of usage, the first thing you have to do is reduce usage through what we call radical resource productivity. And then you need to take that, you meet those remaining needs with renewables. And I'll, I'll talk briefly about renewables, what they are. But if you look at this, and it's got to be in this sequence. You have to reduce need, reduce demand through efficiency, and then replace it with renewables. As some environmentalists say, you have to eat your efficiency vegetables before you get to have your renewable dessert. But you have to do it in that sequence because to take renewable fuel and put it into an inefficient engine doesn't make sense, right? First get efficiency, then add renewables. So let's talk about that. Oh, we use two big pivotal concepts, whole systems thinking, 
and end use efficiency. And let, uh, just to give you a little more about the Institute, because I'm here, uh, here are some books that we've put out that I think presaged pivotal shifts. One is on what we call natural capitalism. How do you really engage with the world in a type of capitalism that keeps the world in mind, that, th that acts as if we are part of the earth? Uh, we have small is profitable, which is a play on small is beautiful. And this is a different way to look at power generation. And then the last one, winning the oil end game, is a realistic game plan to get us off oil by 2040, led by business for profit. Now, these are visionary thoughts. These books are available. You can get, I think, any of them. I know you can get Winning the Oil Endgame for free, downloaded on the internet. I mean, we want, we want people to have this. And they're moving targets. We're working on another really cool one now. We've got a guy named Amory Lovins. Has anybody heard of him? Huge visionary genius, won every award in history, completely impossible to manage. And... Uh, We've got a number of other thought leaders and a number of great young fellows, interns, consultants, principals, etc., that are driving the work forward. And we work with some of the greatest organizations in the world that are trying to become greater, governments, utilities, companies, to try to help them figure out how to win in the new energy economy. In energy use in the U.S. is built into rough thirds on transportation, buildings, and industrial use. And we have a work group or practice around each one of those. And in each one of those, we have what we call an initiative, which is our attempt at a visionary shift to help these people understand where they have to get and how they're going to get there. And it's not just us making it up. We collaborate with the people in the industries and try to help co-create a vision of how to move things forward. And as oil prices rise and fall, as attention on the climate or on security rises and falls, we are a nonprofit institute that remains focused on these issues no matter what the trends are to try to help our civilization shift. So it's cool work. But I'd propose that it's all of our work. i to check my time, good. So, First thing I want to talk about is cool buildings. And cool buildings has two meanings to it, obviously. One is the cool in terms of climate change. The other aspect of cool is we don't think people will adopt cool buildings unless they are cool, too, unless they're great to work in, unless we can take this opportunity of transformation to make it a better place for people as well as a better place for the world. So I want to talk to you about that for a second. The way that we think of buildings in the United States and the, and the Western approach to buildings is all about divide and conquer. When you look at a building, what most builders and developers think about is a conglomeration of components, all the different things that go into that building to make it work. One aspect of that is that if we look at improvements, that would make a building more earth friendly, most people look at them on, a, on an improvement by improvement, component by component, bit by bit basis. And then they'll take the value of daylighting, let's say, and look at the savings per year and say, this, uh, you know, this does meet my criteria or it doesn't. I, let's say I have a hurdle rate of five years so, and, and something has to pay back in five years or less. So I'm going to do the lighting, I'm going to do the daylighting, but I'm not going to do the energy efficient HVAC. That's typically the way most people approach these questions. Wouldn't you agree? And, and this is called value engineering, which, in my opinion, provides neither value nor engineering. But I'll tell you why. We have an approach that we call tunneling through the cost barrier. And most people see a range of possible improvements and, as, uh, and they stop when they look like they're not cost effective anymore. They say, okay, that we're going to stop the list right there. What we do is we try to work with people 
to blow through that false limitation and to continue to provide more and better improvements until it happens, and you can't really read this, but it, what happens is those, the cumulative improvements allow us to rethink the nature of the building and actually reduce a lot of the infrastructure. In other words, if you look at energy efficient windows, they may take seven years to pay off on their own, which doesn't meet your hurdle rate. However, we can work with you so that you can see that you can reduce your investment in HVAC and heating, et cetera, et cetera, so that the building as a whole has a better ROI. So we have to stop componentizing and we have to pull it together in, in a concept we call integrative design. And integrative design requires a lot of work and a lot of thinking from a calculus point of view, not from an arithmetic point of view, but from a whole systems point of view. And it requires what we have a bunch of energy modelers who will go into a building and they do this stuff that most people don't even think about to try to model out how this building is really going to function. What are the people going to do in it? What is the, what's the world around it? What are the seasons like? I'll give you an example. This was a building for the Missouri Department of Natural Resources and the, the uh, uh, architect got us involved. And it was a great challenge because they said, all right, it's going to be 120,000 square feet, 400 occupants, 17 million, that's it. But we are the Department of Natural Resources, so make it really cool. All right, so first thing we did was we looked at the orientation. You look at where is the sun? What's up with the wind? What about the position of the building? What, what would make sense? Instead of just plopping it down on where it looks like it would be easy, why don't we pretend that there's sun and wind and rain that, could, that we could use, that we could work with? And taking that further, what about effective daylighting? What if we design the building so that we're not battling the light that comes down, but we're accepting it and taking it in? But while we're also doing that, we're using the structure of the building for shading and installation so that we're designing, it, uh, designing an interaction with nature that makes sense. You do all of this, and we can dramatically downsize the HVAC and we can also, in this case, we used uh, geothermal, which reduced the long-term energy use. And, and in that case, it uses the, the heat differential underground that's already there. Then we added solar paneling. Now we put all this together and look at what happens to the energy use. The orange bars are typical energy use or the anticipated energy use for code. And the purple bars are the actual energy use. And you can see that most buildings actually have a battle with the world where they, they don't use daylighting, so they have to put in a ton of regular lighting, and then the regular lighting creates heat in the summer, when you have your peak times anyway, which is boosting your HVAC requirement, you're basically creating a cycle where, that, whose outcome is excessive energy use. Or to make it worse, I, I'm going to talk about an iconic building but we didn't, that, we, that is announced today, by the way. Um, uh, we worked with this building where they said, uh, we have air conditioning. The air conditioning is uneven. Everybody insists on air conditioning, but with this building, it's a pre-war building, so we can't make it even. It's impossible. So some places are colder than others. So since people have to go in different rooms, they tend to dress for the warmest. But that make, makes us have to cool off the building more because they're uncomfortable when they're sitting at their desk. But when we do that, and I am not kidding, a third of their female employees in this massive building have space heaters under their desks in the summer. I'm not exaggerating. Plus, most large buildings have their air conditioners running all through the winter. I mean, this is true. This is not integrative design with nature. So here's the net with this building. 
zero increase in capital costs, we, including the solar panels. The building costs the same as they had originally budgeted, $80,000 per year in energy costs. And we got a bunch of other cool statistics about water use, it's local lumber, all this other stuff. And the other cool thing is, it's gorgeous. Everybody loves working there. And it's lead platinum. In fact, up until now, out of the lead platinum buildings that are completed in the world, RMI has been part of a third of them. So we've really been a proud uh, participant. But now there's so many, there's, there's so many lead buildings under construction that I'm not going to be able to say that for long. So I'm just telling everybody, as long as the statistic is still good. So let's take our previous cost analysis approach, and let's say that doesn't make sense. Take another approach and say we have added cost of 26,000, but we were able to think of this as a whole system and reduce cost by 21,000 in infrastructure. So if you make something more efficient, then you can usually downsize the infrastructure, and I'll show you how that works on vehicles as well later. And then, but we do have an incremental cost overall, but in this case, this is an actual business office building in Denver. We paid off in one year, and we did a lot of things that on a single line item did not pay off. So is everybody with me on this? So it's, a, it's very interesting, but it's complex, and, it, and, and you really have to work it. And the way you work it is in what we call charrettes, where you have to get specialists to collaborate together and figure out how to re-envision the work you're doing with an eye toward energy use and an eye toward how do we want this building to interact with the world and to interact with the people that are in it. And we call this whole systems thinking. This is behind everything we do. So here's some examples. Fossil Ridge High School, we helped to design that. Huge breakthrough, same capital cost. Here's a retrofit we did with Adobe Systems. Big payback, and that was for an existing building. This is a really interesting building in Paris called Energy Positive, I believe. And uh, it isn't built yet, but on paper, it looks like this building will contribute 20% more energy to the grid than it consumes. And this is where we want to take the built environment. We want to work with the people in the industry to create a world where the built environment is adding energy. And I want to challenge the concept of sustainability. You know, sustainability, the, the concept is, as the provost very rightly pointed out, how can we satisfy our reasonable needs without compromising the ability of future generations to satisfy their reasonable needs? That's sustainability, and that's at risk. We don't have that figured out. But I have to say, if we figure it out, it's only a C. You know, it basically means we stop stealing. I mean, is that really that great? I'd rather say we want to create a world that's going to create a better world for future generations. More wisdom, more services, more in line with the way the world works. Let's go for that. And one of the things about buildings is if it's so easy, why isn't everybody doing it? And this is what I run into. I'll talk to a donor or an executive or a, uh, or a uh, politician. And I say, if you give us that building, we'll reduce the energy use by 60 to 80%. And they go, oh, really? And I can see they're like, yeah, right, sure. If it's that easy, why isn't everybody doing it? It's like the economist question. That can't be a $20 bill on the ground, because as an economist, I know if it was, somebody would have already found it. But this is why people aren't already doing it. If you look at any building, a building is a collaboration of a bunch of different parties that have their own incentives, that have their own issues, that have their own ways that they need to work and ways that they win. And right now, our system looks as if it was designed to blow as much energy as possible, basically. Whilst the, this is the first time I can say this. The Empire State Building, there's an announcement today in New York. Our chief scientist, Amory, is going to be the, Tony Malkin, the owner of the 
the Empire State Building. Uh, Bill Clinton will be there. It's a huge, iconic building, and we have worked with the Clinton Initiative and a bunch of other parties to build a plan where we're going to reduce energy use at the Empire State Building by 38%. I mean, that, that's huge. When we got there with some others, they were planning on making a 12% improvement. And we worked with them, and this took eight months. So this is not easy. I'm not trying to say we can just walk in and snap our fingers. We worked with them for eight months. And the first thing we did is we identified a technical potential of 85%, which meant if money was not an object and we just did whatever we felt like, we modeled out and proved to them with a pretty high level of certitude that we could cut 85% of the energy use. And they're like, wow. Well, that doesn't automatically mean you're going to do the 85%. So what we did is we worked through different scenarios and looked at these methodologies and how could we combine them. And we came up with a number of packages, a 12% package, a 20% package, a 38% package, a 60% package. And they put them all together and we had all these gives and takes and all these sensitivity analyses and blah, 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 lots of work. And by the way, we were fighting them through most of it. Oh, here's an interesting thing. In a lot of cities, including New York, the landlord charges an upcharge on energy charges. So if the landlord saves energy, first of all, the client saves all the money, but the landlord loses profit. I mean, this is a, this is a perverse incentive that just makes it hard to make changes. But in this case, we have a visionary uh, owner who is, is really pushing the envelope, and he's going to the, the, his tenants, there are 500 of them, and renegotiating all the leases so that they can share the energy savings. That's a lot of work. And by the way, who pays for renegotiating 500 leases? This is visionary, and it's tough. But we're breaking through the barrier because we have an owner, and we have a lot of publicity and all this, and this is the only way you're going to push the needle. And these types of perverse incentives have created a, wor a world where 75 to 90 percent of the fossil fuels we consume are just wasted. They're shot right out of the tailpipe. Why? The fundamental reason is we just don't pay that much for energy. It's incredibly cheap. We get, I get to pick to stop by and pick up one gallon of gas for less than two bucks, which is one month of man work. And I don't think about it. It's 40 million, 40 million years of Earth effort, but I don't think about it. In a way, you could think of it, what if you saved a million dollars for the safety of your children, and you put it in the bank, and then you died? And then your children thought of that money uh, in a way that the only cost to them is the hassle of stopping by the bank to pick it up. That's kind of how this is, in a way. Although, by the way, I didn't mean to say that would be any of our children. Our children all understand the value of money. So th that's not anything we'd have to deal with. But this is the world we live in. And this leads, again, to this concept that we need to take our standard practice and drive radical resource productivity to reduce use. Now, when I say this chart didn't come out very well, on this slide, but when I say that 75 to 90 percent of our energy is wasted, this is an example. And I just want to show it to you. I'll try to walk you through it. This is showing from a power plant down to the actual units of energy used. And yeah, I think that really isn't coming out well. But it shows that we lose 70 percent of the energy right at the power plant because of poor design, heat loss, etc. Then we have transmission and distribution losses and a number of other things down the line. So by the time you get to real units of energy output, it's 9.5% of the original energy consumed. Now let me ask you, just as a thought experiment, if you wanted to tweak this system, where would you go first? I'm sorry? That's what most people think. And, of course, it's a trick question, so thank you for saying it out loud. And, 
And really, that is what most people think because you see the 70% waste. But if you, if you reverse the thinking and think in terms of multipliers, if I can go to the end use for every one unit of efficiency I get, I'm saving 10 times as much by the time it goes down the line. So what we do is we say, start with the end use and then work back through the chain. Make the end use as efficient as you possibly can, and then you plug the leaks in the pipeline going back from there. And if you don't, then when you run out of energy, you've got to build another power plant that's 70% inefficient. You with me? Here's an, and that gets to end use efficiency. Here's a, another example, and this is a... Uh, an IT example for the energy that goes into uh, data centers. And this shows that out of 100 watts, about 18 of them, and this is the plug load that they get. This isn't including the power plant and everything. When they plug their plug in, only 18% of 100 watts is going into useful computing. And, and we've worked, actually, we had an interesting thing. We worked with EDS, and we helped them design a visionary data center in Scotland. And, uh, and we did the, you know, the climate responsive design and all that. We created a, a data center that required no cooling. And we're like, is that cool or what? And they said, well, wait a second. You said, no chillers? We said, yeah, no chillers. You don't need any chillers. And he said, well, what if this? What if that? And we got through all of them, except if there is a fire where there's sooty smoke in the area for five days, they would have to shut down their IT center. And we're like, like that's going to happen? And the guy talking to us said, hey, wait, if that happens, you don't get fired. I get fired. So there are chillers in the IT. Uh, but still, a lot less than they would have otherwise. And that's kind of the the interplay between our theory and people's reality, which is part of the game. Then the real irony is we worked at a higher level with EDS to redesign their data center philosophy and approach, and we designed out our own redesigned data center, which is an irony after all that work. However, they're going to go ahead and build it because they had committed locally to it, luckily. Anyway, these are the types of ways, and I just want to share with you the type of thinking of instead of business as usual, really going after what if we rethought this? What if you took a long-term approach and really said, I'm just not going to do it that way? And we talked before about Walmart. We do a lot of work with Walmart. Walmart is trying to drive this corporate culture against waste. They don't talk about em emissions or the climate or even the economics. They say waste is bad. We don't care. We don't care. Uh, we don't care why it's bad. We just know it's bad. So we're trying to drive waste out of our system. Here's another example, and this is the car that we all drive. And this is an example of where energy is lost in a car. And I won't take you through all the components, except to tell you that out of the energy that you burn in a car, only six percent of the energy you burn moves the car. And the paradox of that is that of that 6%, you're not very much of it. And if you really, I don't know about you, but I don't get in my car in order to move a big hunk of iron up to Greeley. I want to move myself, right? Isn't that the end use, getting myself around? In the meantime, I get to take a huge hunk of iron along for a ride. And that means that only half a percent of the fuel that I burned to get here this morning was moving me. It's an interesting thought, eh? So this leads to another initiative we have, winning the oil end game, of how do we work, uh, try to create a world where we, um, uh, where we aren't dependent on oil. And one of the big trends, which you may have heard about, is in passenger cars. That's happening now. And uh, there are two big trends, light weighting and electrification. This is a Toyota concept car. It's got the same capacity as a Prius, but it's about a third of the uh, tonnage. It's about 1,000 pounds. Here's the Tata Nano. Have you heard about that? 
There's, it's coming in at 58 miles a gallon. Some people say in 68, we'll see how the testing comes out. And a lot of that is fudge factor anyway. But it's very efficient, costs $2,500. Here are four other cars that are available. That these are commercially available. Electric, or no, I'm sorry. The one up on the upper right is a Chevy Volt. It's coming out next year. It's the only one of these cars that is created by one of the big three automakers. And I'll see if that slide made it in. Yeah, this was last week in the New York Times. China vies to be world's leader in electric cars. Why are we going to have electric cars? Even in China, where they burn mostly coal, you still reduce emissions by 19% in an electric car versus a gas car. But if you can get to a renewable grid and clean up the grid, you can affect cars that way. But there's, it's very hard to affect emissions in a car because it just takes a certain amount of gas to get you around. There are other reasons why electric cars are coming. And there's a tsunami. The question is what the timing is. Uh, I sat with a group of engineers in Detroit and I asked them, what's the maintenance difference in an electric car versus an internal combustion engine car? Their estimate, 80 to 90 percent less maintenance. What will that do to our car aftermarket if instead of this huge complex hunk of iron that is creating, that, that is literally driving millions of explosions a day by design, if you have a battery and a little electric motor like a razor taking you around town. And when you use your brakes, it's capturing that energy. We're, we're going to see huge disruptions there. And the, the blocking factors, the barriers to quick adoption are number one, our average car stays on the road for 16 miles. Number two, oil prices have plummeted. And number three, the manufacturers aren't making this. They have these huge factories to make internal combustion engines and, and those vehicles. So what's the disrupting factor? China. So we're going to see, but expect big changes. Also big changes in trucking. About 5% of our fuel, 1% of our emissions come from trucking. Hugely inefficient. Average big truck gets about six miles per gallon. And we've got an initiative going now with the trucking industry. In fact, next week we've got a, uh, a, uh, an event in Denver. Yeah, it's in Denver, where we're going to have a bunch of people from truck manufacturers, Walmart, etc., to come. How do we rethink the whole trucking system to make it dramatically more efficient? We, does it, do we say there? We're trying to drive to three times efficiency, and we think that's possible. So if you think about this, if you back up a little bit, and you think about the way our economy is structured, the way we even think about ourselves. I mean, gross domestic product, even that way of measuring our, our progress, it isn't really very tied to how happy we are or how comfortable we are or how well our needs are met. If you have a factory that's cranking out a bunch of things that are thrown away immediately, that's going to be a higher GDP than a bunch of things that people keep in use for a long time, right? So in a way, using GDP as a me measure has the waste multiplier built in as a positive factor. And if you think about where people work in our, our economy, they work in industries that are dependent on the consumption of fossil fuels. So here's an example, you know, cars, then you have the oil industry that is serving people with cars. Then you have air conditioning, which is the biggest plug load after lighting. You know, if you think about it, there's air conditioning everywhere. It was just invented in the 1930s. I mean, we lived without it, or we didn't, but somebody did. But now it's got to be everywhere. And then you need all the com companies that are working with them. Basically, a large segment of our economy is built on big machines guzzling lots of fuel. And, you know, the more fuel, the better. The more guzzling, the better. And these are not bad people. These are good people that are trying to put their kids through college, that are working hard, that have an MBO to push a little more oil here or get a little more air conditioning there. And, by the way, there's nothing wrong with that. But you can see that we've got factors that are not lining up. And if 
there were issues in the world economy where the seams started to fall apart, what would that look like? And the question is, would it look like what we're going through now? So most people just don't know what's going on. In other words, IT managers, we, we did a survey last year, 85% of the IT managers, information technology managers in the US never see their own energy bill. So are we astounded that they aren't managing their energy use? They don't even know. Most consumers don't know what their energy bill is. There, there's a guy who runs Tendril Systems, this system that allows, gives you a lot of feedback and tells you how you're doing versus your neighbors. And, your, and these are huge behavioral shifts, 10 to 30%. All you gotta do is let people know what they're using, it immediately drops 10 to 30%. What he says is it's like you go to the grocery store, you get a bunch of stuff, and then they send you a bill a month later without any detail of what you used. That, that's really what your energy consumption is now. And you know, the car companies don't pay for your gas. Architects don't pay the energy bills later. The linkages are so loose that it's not amazing that we live in this world where nothing's, nothing's really very efficient. And probably the most unconscious energy use of all is electricity. I mean, electricity is just amazing. Some people say it was the pivotal, the crowning achievement of the 20th century. The fact that I can go to a Starbucks and plug my PC into the wall and don't even pay anybody for it. I mean, imagine if you grab somebody from the 1890s and pulled them into a Starbucks to start with. But then, you know, PC, here, let me give, you want to, there's a call, you want to talk on my iPhone, you know, where, uh, what would they think? And we don't even think about it. Kids, you know, uh, tell you the truth, I'm just as bad. I turn on the TV, somebody says, how's that TV work? I'm like, very simple, you turn it on. You know, that, that's how it works. You talk to a kid about electricity, they're like, you put the plug in the wall, duh. But most people don't have any idea where this power comes from, even though we are completely dependent on it. Where it comes from is about half coal in the United States. And this proportion is pretty right worldwide. I mean, different countries have different things, but at least half coal. More than half here in Colorado for us. And then it's about 20% natural gas, 20% nuclear, 10% other stuff. Like Hawaii is all oil. You know, Hawaii gets all their power from oil, which makes total sense, doesn't it? Because they don't have any sun in Hawaii. So why would they ever use photovoltaics there? It makes a lot more sense to dig oil out of the ground, put it on a tanker, et cetera. The same way that 90% that of their food is imported into Hawaii because they're not capable of growing anything there, but don't get me started on that one. Anyway, this is, this is the energy mix. And what happens is we have these big plants out in the middle of nowhere that burn stuff up. There's a natural gas plant, and this is the hottest thing going right now, natural gas, because you can't build coal plants anymore. Sierra Club and all these people fly into town, you know, have demonstrations, go crazy. So the utilities, when they have a peak issue, they build a, quietly build a natural gas plant, which is cheaper and faster to build. It has less emissions, but it's much more expensive to operate because it's much more fuel intensive. Nuclear, big issue. Should we do nuclear? Should we not do nu nuclear? We have positions and thoughts about this. But in general, most people are asking the wrong question. They're saying, how do we go get more power? Let's go get more power. And we're saying, we're blowing 90% of what we use. The cheapest form of power is efficiency. It's way cheaper to save a barrel of oil than to go find it and argue with somebody about it. And then we have this huge network, uh, this grid, which is still very primitive. I talked to one of our public utility commissioners um, last week, and he said, you know what? If Thomas Edison walked in a power plant today, it would take him three minutes to get the lay of the land. You know, nothing's really that new. It's all the same type of stuff that he looked at when he put together the first big accelerometers in the early uh, 20th century. So our initiative is what we call next generation utility. 
And what we want to do is help the utilities build a realistic plan to move from a base load of coal and nuclear, spiced up with some natural gas and, and oil, to a base load of energy efficiency and renewables. And we really think it's possible to have a 30 or 40 percent shift from consumption to efficiency and to do it cost effectively. But we have to work with the existing interests to make that possible. So here's where we're to the third or the second part of this um, equation, and that's meeting the remaining needs with renewables. So I, 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 this is a little technical. This is called a load curve. Does anybody here work for a utility? No? Good. I can say anything. Nobody will check my facts. That's, that's why I wanted to know. No, actually, this is the way a utility looks at the world. And, and this is a graphical representation of all the hours in a year. I can't remember. I want to say 5,760 or something like that. I can't remember the exact number. Um, and the, the load for each of those hours. And on the left, you see the high peak loads. That's 5 o'clock in the afternoon on August 16th. But you've got to get people power. I mean, they're not like, hey, it's hot out. I get it. I won't get power today. You know, they, we just totally assume we're going to have it. So the utility has to staff, has to build to the peaks. So this is the load. And you know, at the right is uh, you know, a temperate day in October in the middle of the night. You just aren't going to have a lot of demand then. So what we do is first we're going to drive efficiency for 20 or 30 percent of that load and also to mitigate the growth that's still happening. Then after that, we, can, we are working with the utilities to what we call firm renewables. And the problem, there are a number of challenges with renewables just because we haven't figured them out yet. When you have wind blowing or sun or whatever, it isn't going all the time. I mean, you can count on a, a coal plant. They, all you got to do is get the coal there, and you know it's going to churn out a certain amount of um, wattage every hour. You don't know that from the sun. So how do you smooth that? How do you design a system that's responsive to that and can use that? And we're working on that with utilities to come up with a new science of how do you manage that type of, uh, that type of energy. We'll still have a gap. And the way we can address that gap is by combined cooling, heat, and power. I mean, when, when you saw that 70% of a power plant's energy is released through waste heat, we can use that. There's district heat, heating where we can heat a whole district. And in the summertime, you can use that heat to create air conditioning. You just have to be thoughtful about it. And so this is the distributed concept. And this is, you know, solar panels on somebody's house. Put it on your house. That way you don't have to pay for somebody to build a power plant someplace. And then you don't have to pay for a bunch of people in an office to write a bill to you and then to collect your money and all that stuff. You, the sun is hitting your roof. You just use that as power. Now, right now, uh, not so easy because they haven't built as many solar, um, solar panels as they've built cell phones. So the cost curve hasn't come down. You remember what cell phones cost? I mean, I, I'm old enough. I remember seeing on TV a film of somebody who had a phone in their car, and I'm like, that would be cool. You know, now we don't even think about it. It used to be a cell phone was 40 grand, then 10 grand, then 2 grand, or calculators, or PCs, you name it. Photovoltaics are still in the early phase of that transition, and we're not there yet, but it, it'll get there. And here's, there's a scientist at, at uh, Caltech that has done an analysis where he said we could get three terawatts of electricity, which is about what our nation will need in 2030, out of one site in the United States, 50,000 square miles. Now, he, his name is Nate Lewis, great guy, and you can look him up. By the way, he's a great guy to look up on the internet, Nate Lewis at Caltech. And you can see his whole PowerPoint. He'll, you, know, you can watch the video of his whole pitch. Very, very enlightening, super smart guy. He's presented this for 12 years. He said he's never talked to anybody who lives in that grid. <laughs> so, so you could build that. You could do that. 
although it would be all kinds of transmission problems and all that stuff. We've got a board member who works for SunPower, a, uh, a, a uh, solar company, and they figured out that you could power the whole state of um, New Jersey just by putting solar on their Superfund sites that are not habitable right now. And that's not even counting rooftops, etc. There's all kinds of great thinking going on right now. And this is another Nate Lewis slide where he says, we could do the whole world. All we need is six sites and transmission. Now, it, it's going to be a lot more complicated than this, but it's an interesting thought that every 50 minutes, enough sun hits the earth to power everything we're doing for a year. So, and that's really the only renewable resource uh, you can really look at. I mean, wind, which, and wind is a implementation of solar power because it's just wind moves because of the sun. Uh, in the U.S., they calcul calculate that wind could do as much as 20%. But we're going to need solar to really make it work. And here's an example of a world that we are working with utilities to realize, and that is where we have plug-in hybrids or electric cars, and if you have, you know, just 50 million or 100 million of those vehicles on the road, they become a virtual storage mechanism for the energy of the grid. So you could power up in the middle of the night, you could drive to your office, you plug in at your office, and it knows through the interface that it's you, it knows that you've allowed them to draw down on your battery during a peak time down to 75 percent of its capacity so that while you're at the office they're actually using your power and uh, paying you back on your bill for it because you charged up in the middle of the night the crazy thing is in the summertime utilities are rushing to handle the peaks and they're paying people to offload the grid at night to get the power off the grid to keep it coordinated. So there are all kinds of really exciting things. And, and part of this is us creating a world where our built environment and our transportation and the power generation are all integrated and smart in a way that really makes sense. Okay, now that's kind of the solutions. Everybody with me? So let's go into some futures, and I'm going to really shoot through this. We want to get to a place of solar equilibrium, where we're getting energy out of the sun, and we're living within our solar budget every year. And that way we can use oil to make plastics. What we want to do is take this fossil fuel transmission chain and simplify it. Instead of the put it in the earth for 40 million years, we just cut that part out. And we go right from the sun to what we need. We call this reinventing fire. And where are we headed? Here's some ideas, just some thought provokers. Uh, and how do we think of the future? If you can't read this, I'll read it to you. This is a picture from the 50s about what the future would look like. Because everything in her home is waterproof, the housewife of 2000 can do her daily cleaning with a hose. What a dream! Gosh, I wish it had gone that way. Well, needless to say, we don't always have the best picture of the future, although we have a creative one. And usually, our picture of the future is what they call techno-optimism. You know, technology has gotten us this far. What's it going to do next? Here's some other thoughts. Some people estimate right now less than 1% of our population is farmers. A number of academics estimate that by the mid-century, 50 million people will be farmers. That food production is going to shift back. And it will be distributed. There will be urban farms. There will be a lot more farmers markets. There's a huge surging farmers market movement right now. If you go to a farmer's market, you're 12 times more likely to chat with somebody than if you go to a grocery store. It's a re renewed sense of community, et cetera, et cetera. Huge shift. So this is a big pivotal shift. Here's another pivotal shift. 
400 commercial airports today. Will we have 50 in 20 years? A 40% drop in flight? Will air, airlines, will we all be driving these huge blimpy air buses? That's what a lot of people are predicting because you can electrify road transport, you can't electrify air transport. So if oil makes a, a, a long slog toward unaffordability, this is gonna change our lives. And for me, who has a grandson living in Calgary, Canada, that's gonna really be a hassle. So we'll see, our, life is, our lives are really dependent on this ability to get wherever we wanna go. How will that change? There's, there are a bunch of trends that people are pushing about that. Staycations. I mean, Cancun is the biggest vacation spot in the world. Not if this happens. And how about a shift to local commerce? Two of the big drivers be, behind the success of Walmart are, one, essentially free transport. Transport is cheap as a percentage of goods. Um, what if it was more expensive? And also the unlimited ability of capital and fuel growth. And if those two vectors are changing, along with a number of other things, we may see a shift to a lot more local commerce, local value, local creation, a world where it isn't true that if it can be made anywhere, it's gonna be made in China and they're gonna stop making it here. That may shift. So those are real trends happening. And I propose that we need to learn new ways of thinking where the 19th century was city oriented. My world is my city. 20th century was nation building. We can't get around it. 21st century, we are realizing we live in a limited world and it's going to be a different way of thinking. All right. Uh, Google's an example. Sorry, I got into my own thing and I'm, I'm uh, a little behind, so I'm going to really shoot through a couple slides. Why is Google successful? Because they focus on services, not stuff. And if you look at Microsoft versus Google, Google is winning. How about Craigslist versus the Chicago Tribune, which went bankrupt? Netflix versus Blockbuster, iTunes versus Universal Music. We're seeing the move to bits. What are things that you can move without moving atoms, but just moving bits, electrons? Another thing, Patagonia. Anybody familiar with Patagonia? I talked to one of our employees. He told me about his girlfriend. He said, I met her parents. They're really cool. They wear all Patagonia. You know, that is, that's a statement now. This is Yvonne Chouinard. He's a supporter of RMI. We do some stuff with him. Cool guy. Look at this. Kick your butt tough shorts. This is like anti-GDP. We'll sell you shorts that last for 20 years. Doesn't mean throw them away and buy new shorts. It's a different way of thinking. It's anti-GDP. And he appeals to people that make values-based decisions. He was a big pusher of the organic cotton and he raised his prices and, his, and he just said, we're going all organic. And people outside the industry go, well, he can do that because he's got a loyal customer base. And I think it's the opposite. He's got a loyal customer base because he's values-based. And this is a board member of ours. This is just a carpet company. And they make carpet out of petroleum products and they have a zero emissions goal, and they're 45% of the way there after 10 years, and they think they're gonna get there. They've got a plan to get there. And what Ray Anderson says is that we're in an industry that nobody ever thought could transform, and we're pulling it off, and we're growing, and people are buying from us, but more than that, we have unleashed an incredible source of enthusiasm and commitment from our employees, way beyond what we, could have imagined. And, and they've taken off. He doesn't have to go in and cheerlead them. They have taken off. So is this a leap of faith? Yes. You're going to see, John is going to present what can you do later. And these discussions are going to be more and more specific, which is great. But I challenge you that you have a personal responsibility to learn about this yourself invest 60 hours or more of your time to find out what's going on in the world and in your industry. It's not gonna be one hour 
presentation or TV show or one book. This is as important as your health as anything else. If you knew that your kids were going to face some huge challenge in 30 years, wouldn't you invest 60 hours of your time to find out about it? So I'm saying when I see people that are really engaged and really get what's going on and they're changing their businesses and their lives and all that, they dove in. They didn't, they didn't just go, hey, thanks, now I'm going to change everything. And by the way, I don't have this short checklist of do this, change your light bulbs, etc. It's just a bigger issue than this. And feel free to check out our website because we can blow probably half of those 60 hours just bouncing around on our stuff. So anyway, I apologize. I don't have time for questions, I think. Um, but I really appreciate your attention.